Heavenly Father, we thank you for this good news of the gospel that releases us from captivity. We thank you for Jesus, and we thank you this morning that there is no condemnation and that we can boldly come into your divine presence. We give you great thanks, Father, for our time together over these days, for the worship, music, and creativity. We thank you, Father, for the Word of God. We thank you especially for what we have learned of the Ten Commandments, and we especially are thankful for the Holy Spirit who brings light to our hearts. We thank you, Father, for our friendship, for our interaction, for our relationships. And now, Lord, we pray your blessing on this morning's service. We want to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and glorify his holy name together. And Lord, may we all go from this place with a new understanding of God's word, a new sense of enlightenment by the Holy Spirit and a new determination to follow Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, as we return to our homes and our churches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The reading is from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month they shall take every man a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then a man and his neighbor next to his house shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your, make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs in the evening. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat them. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled with water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall fall upon you, to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. There is uh, a great deal uh, that I could say about our speaker this morning. Having known him for many years from when he was at university at Cambridge. And uh, I'm not going to embarrass him. But what I am going to say is that there are certain people in this country for whom we ought to pray very specifically. We ought to pray for them because God has anointed them and encouraged them. Because God has given them opportunities and position. Because there is great potential for God to use them in the future. And because they have not compromised 
but have stayed true to their position and have real significance in the working of their denomination and their tribe within the UK. One such person is our speaker this morning, Pete Broadbent. Pete and his wife Sarah are very, very good friends of Ruth and I. Pete is the Archdeacon of Northolt. God alone knows what Pete will do in the future and how he will use Pete and Sarah. But I would encourage you to pray for them as a couple and to pray for Pete now as he comes to minister to us. That's exactly what we're going to do. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you for one another. Thank you for the way you gift each other. Thank you for the way that you make each one of us as individuals and then you throw away the mold. Lord, we bless you that in your body you've given us specific gifts. Thank you for Pete and Sarah this morning, for the ministry you've given them, for the grace that you've entrusted to them, for the position you've placed them in. We want to ask that uh, as Pete ministers to us, he may just know a freedom in his spirit, love and joy in his heart, and that sense of your hand of approval upon him, uh, pushing him forward, blessing him and using him. Lord, we want to pray for him and for those like him, that Lord Jesus, within the Church of England, within the Baptist Church, within the new churches, among the Methodists, URC, Salvationists, Brethren, Pentecostals, group after group, you may raise up men and women of God who will give leadership in the future that will take on from leadership of the past and will move us forward to all that God has for us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I had a, a tragic moment a week or so ago, a moment of great poignancy, because somebody died who meant a lot to me, the Reverend W. Audrey. Marvellous guy, 85 years old, who wrote those stories that were part of my youth and perhaps part of yours too, the railway stories. And what's interesting was that when they talked about him, they realised that he'd actually written those stories to help people understand God. The engines behaved naughtily and they were punished. The engines behaved well and they found that things went well. He tried to teach things through stories. I enjoyed him. And as I was thinking and praying this morning about what to share with you, I thought, I'll tell you what, I'll tell him a story. Are you sitting comfortably? This is the story of Dooley the Elf. Dooley the Elf had grown tired of living where he did, in the dark country. He'd grown tired of living the way he did. He worked in a terrible place called Drudge City. His life was a mess, and the lord of the dark country had him under a spell. And so Dooley the Elf left his home his loved ones, and he went on a journey. He travelled many miles until he came to the great wasteland called the Ness, the Ness of Skeg. <laughs> He'd heard it said that there were those people who knew how to break the spell of the Lord of the Dark Country, and when he got to the Ness of Skeg, he searched high and low until he found someone who could help him. In fact, he found several someones. In fact, he found hundreds of someones. They were joyful people, and they lived on a high mountain called Big Top. As he spoke to them, Dooley discovered that these were people who could actually show him how to break the spell of the Lord of the Dark Country. How can it be, he asked. What do I have to do? Do, they said. 
you haven't got to do anything. Just open your mouth and speak to the great high king and tell him you're sorry for following the rules of the Lord of the Dark Country and he'll give you a king's pardon. You know the story about the, Lord of the, the, the great high king? His son was killed by the Lord of the Dark Country but now he's alive again. And Dooley the elf found it was true. It was all true. He spoke to the great high king and the high king gave him a king's pardon. But the story didn't end there because Dooley said, well, the spell I'm under is a terrible spell because not only in the dark country do we live in the fear of the Lord of the dark country, we're all forced to live behind walls and to fight each other. I'll have no fear about that, they said. The High King's son has a magical Kango hammer. <laughs> and you can take it back with you. And it works itself. You haven't got to use it. It breaks down walls. It's said that this magical Kango hammer has the power of the High King's son within it. Well, Dooley was amazed. Do you mean, he said, I can go back to the dark country and I can live with a king's pardon, the spell's broken? Do you mean that I can go back with a magical Kango hammer and those walls will be broken down by the power of the high king's son? This is amazing. Why has nobody told me this before? Uh, and one of the elders of the community that was there in the Ness of Skeg took him aside and they gave him a scroll. What's this, said Dooley, this scroll? Ah, it's a secret plan. A secret plan, said Dooley, yes, a secret plan. Uh, and you must show it to everybody in the dark country. Don't be daft, said Dooley. You don't show secret plans to everybody. <laughs> you do with this one. That's the way it works. It's what the High Kings decreed. You've got to take this sacred plan back with you, this scroll, and you've got to tell it to everybody. Well, Dooley was a bit gobsmacked by all this. And then he said, I'm getting the picture now. It all works backwards, doesn't it? There's a pardon that you can't earn, a Kango hammer that works by itself, a secret plan that isn't secret. This is amazing, he said. But what else do I need for my journey? Well, said the elder, well, there are just uh, two other things. First of all, you need the inextinguishable candle. And then you need the ten tablets. And if you take with you the inextinguishable candle and the ten tablets, you'll be able to show people that you've seen the High King, that you serve him, and that you're no longer in thrall to the Lord of the Dark Country. You better explain those, said Dooley. I'm having trouble with all this. Well, he said, the inextinguishable candle is a light that shines in your life to remind you that you can't go back to the ways of the Lord of the Dark Country. And those ten tablets, well, what you do is, you take them every day, and you'll find the bottle gets replenished every night. But a word of warning, you must also take the tablets with this special life-giving water. Because if you take the tablets without water, they don't work. In fact, they drive you back to the Lord of the Dark Country. But if you take them with the life-giving water, you'll find the tablets work in your life and you change. And you find other people around you changing too. So take with you the life-giving water and keep your life shining with the inextinguishable candle. 
Well, this was great. Duly reveled in his time in the wasteland of Ness. Uh, there was parties. There was singing. Uh, there were serious times when everyone got together uh, and they listened to the words of the high king. And day by day he grew stronger until he knew that he had to go back to the dark country. On the day that he had to leave, the elders took him aside and they said to Dooley the elf, there's just one more thing. When you go back, you're going to have to go back to the city of Drudge. You're a servant of the high king now, you know, and we're going to change your name. Your name was Dooley. It's going to become Dulos. That means slave or servant of the high king. And you have to go and do the hardest thing of all. You have to go and live in the city of Drudge, where you were before, and live differently and your life will show that you serve the High King. Well, Dooley, or Dulos as he was now, blanched at all this. At the thought of going back to the dark country and living in the city of Drudge, that was a bit much. He'd enjoyed himself so much on Big Top Mountain that going back was going to be hard. Surely he couldn't cope. Well, that was the story, uh, and maybe that's where you are now. You've been on the high mountain of Big Top, uh, and all this week you've been taking the things that he's been receiving. Dooley, who became Dulos, had his life changed by his time at Big Top. You're going back with your king's pardon. By grace, you've been saved through faith. Uh, you're going back with your magic kango hammer. With his own body, he broke down the wall that separated them and kept them enemies. You're going back to blurt out that open secret to all the people. In past times, humankind wasn't told this secret, but now God's revealed it through Jesus Christ. You're going back with the inextinguishable candle, living like people who belong to the light. And you're going back with the ten tablets, and you'll take them every day with water. But it's Drudge City that really gets to you, isn't it? Tomorrow morning, or the next morning, or the morning after, you've got to go back to the place where you're called to work, to be in your normal existence, and that's difficult. But you see, in the book the High King gave us, there are some words that help us. At first sight, they don't. But if you read them, from Ephesians chapter 6, you'll find they just might. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling, and do it with a sincere heart, as though you were serving Christ. Do this not only when they're watching you, because you want to gain their approval, but with all your heart do what God wants as slaves of Christ. Do your work as slaves cheerfully, as though you serve the Lord and not merely human beings. Remember that the Lord will reward everyone, whether slave or free, for the good work they do. Masters, behave in the same way towards your slaves and stop using threats. Remember that you and your slaves belong to the same master in heaven who judges everyone by the same standard. You see, if it works at all, it works in Drudge City. If all we've heard this week works at all, it works wherever God's put you. If it works at all, it's got to work in that workplace that God's sending you back to. What are you going back to? Is it a, an unfriendly office? Is it a routine job? Is it working looking after the home? Is it college? Is it school? Or are you unemployed? In the parishes that I work in, in northwest London, uh, we've got a, a year of faith in work. The bishop and I are going round to all the parishes, preaching on work and talking about how work relates to our life in church. I, I guess if I asked you to put your hand up, yeah, stick your hand up if you've ever heard a sermon on faith in work in your church. Just as I thought. We don't talk about it, do we? 
and yet that's where we spend so much of our lives. And if you have heard one, it probably goes a bit like this. Don't swear, don't nick the paper clips, uh, and try to witness. Which is a pretty daft way of talking about it, isn't it? You know, it doesn't actually help you with the everyday life of work. And yet, where God's put you is where he's called you. Your calling is there. It isn't just about being a good witness. It is, it is about that. But it isn't just about being a good witness. It's about the calling to work. And in our churches in Wilsdon, we found that as we've talked about it, it's been liberating for people. People are studying the scriptures together. They're talking about how work affects their everyday lives and what God has to do with that. Uh, they're praying for each other in the difficult situations they're involved in. They're saying, God really cares about what I do. Now, why is that? It's because God gave us work and he believes it's good. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that God gave us work because we are co-workers with him in creation. Part of bearing his image is to be people who are workers. God made us and we bear his image. God the worker who blew on creation, who spoke creation into existence, who made creation in his own image, makes us all fellow creators. And whatever you do, wherever you work, something of that bears the image of God's creativity. There is something about it that is really creative. You're thinking, come on. That's why we don't let clergy talk about work. They don't know the half of it. Creativity in my job, where? There must be some somewhere because God gave us work in creation. But the reason why it's also difficult, why it's Drudge City, is Genesis chapter 3. Because alongside the creative aspect of work, there's also drudge. We're fallen human beings. When Adam and Eve fell, when they disobeyed God, what happened? God said, because of what you've done, the ground is cursed. Because of what you've done, you'll have to bring forth the fruit of your labour in toil. It'll be hard. It'll be horrible. It'll be boring. It'll be routine. And you say, yes, God, tell me about it. It's like that. Work is creative and work is drudge. But we live in Drudge City to serve our Lord, to find the creativity that's there and to serve him in it. And what does Paul say to those who go back to Drudge City? Well, he says that actually there are ways of working that help us live for God. And I've got five from the passage very quickly. First, Paul says... What you do when you work is you work with integrity, as if you were serving Christ. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling. Now, he's talking about slaves because that was the nature of the sort of people who lived in that time. Paul is now smiling in heaven because he's found William Wilberforce and the two of them have got together. And Paul, who knew that slavery would be abolished, is now rejoicing with William Wilberforce that it's happened. But when he wrote in that situation, it wasn't possible. And so he writes to slaves and says, Slaves, obey your human masters and do it with a sincere heart as though you were serving Christ. The, the nature of work is that we do it with integrity. I talked to one guy after one of our faith and work services and said, How do you feel it about it now you're going back? He said, Well, actually, I've already started. Last week I went in and I suddenly found that my whole mindset had changed. What I was doing was doing it for God and not merely for bits of paper. I wasn't any longer pushing paper around and not seeing the whole. I realised that what I was doing was doing something for a God who cared about it. I could see something bigger than just my little bit. And we need that, don't we? Because so much of our work is isolated. We don't see the whole. But if we work with integrity, then God changes it. So with integrity. Secondly... You know that what you're doing is God-given, that God's in it. Do this, verse 6, not only when they're watching you because you want to gain their approval, but with all your heart, do what God wants as slaves of Christ. 
You know what happens normally? The boss isn't watching, you take a break. You play solitaire on the computer. You do something else. But if we're working for God, if God's in it and we're doing it for him, then we do it with our whole heart and that changes it. One of the things we've encouraged people to do this year of work is to say, why not acknowledge the fact that when you come to your workplace, God is there? We've encouraged folk to light a candle at some point during the day and just spend half a minute or a minute in prayer in their workplace. Whatever your way of, of meeting God there, in silence or in tongues or whatever, however you pray the best, why not find half a minute or a minute and acknowledge his lordship of your workplace in some way? Because then you know you're doing it for him. So you work with integrity. You work because you know that God's there. Thirdly, we work cheerfully, verse 7. Do you work as slaves cheerfully as though you serve the Lord and not merely human beings? You know, part of the problem with our workplaces is the pressure we're under. Those of us who are church leaders know that the more we try and ask people to do things in churches these days, the more difficult it is. Because if you're in work, you're asked to work morning, noon and night and a few more hours beside. You haven't got time for family, you certainly haven't got time for church. And there's a sense in which we've got to try and recapture the fact that we need leisure, that if you want the theology of work, it isn't just about work as creative and work as drudge, it's also work where God rested, and we need that rest and leisure and recuperation built into our lives. But part of what we find changes people's working perceptions is when they can bring into it a wholeness and a joy about being there. Now, I don't know what the pressures are for you in your job. I've never experienced them. But I do know that as we pray and ask God to be there in the middle of it, the joy comes. Whether you're at home and your work is looking after uh, three underage, uh, under school age kids or something fairly horrific like that, joyful but horrific, or, or whether your work is in an office or somewhere else. God's joy can be brought into it. And when God's joy comes in, it transforms. The joy of the Lord's my strength, it begins to make a difference. And it makes a difference not only in our own lives, our individual lives, but in our relationships, the people we work with. Because people see that the undercurrent of what we are as human beings is undergirded by joy. We do it cheerfully as the Lord. So with integrity with our own motivation, because it's God-given, cheerfully. And then we also know, verse 8, that what we do has actually got an eternal perspective. You see, when, when Dooley went back as Dulos to the dark country, he went back with his life changed. And we know that life-changing transformation. And therefore we know that we are people who will be rewarded by the Lord. Our work's got an internal perspective. What we do isn't just the humdrum every day, because the humdrum every day leads into the eternity to which God's called us. We are people of eternal life in the here and now. We are people for whom eternal life goes on and on through death into God's presence. That's wonderful stuff. But it means that it transforms what we're doing at the moment. It changes us. Remember, the Lord will reward everyone, whether slave or free, for the good work that you do. Isn't that good news? Doesn't that transform the perspective of what we're about? I think it does. And then a few more things from what Paul says, because he also speaks to those who are employers, to masters as well as slaves. He says, Masters, behave in the same way towards your slaves and stop using threats. Remember you and your slaves belong to the same master in heaven, who judges everyone by the same standard. How do you deal with conflict at work? Do you go the same way as all those you work with? You get in a paddy, you moan about people behind your back, you treat them like dirt if they're inferiors, you boss the secretaries around because they're the lowest of the low. They aren't really. Couldn't operate without them. 
How do we deal with conflict? How do we treat our fellows in the office or where God's put us? And the answer is that as Christians, we're there to bring that salt and light into the context of the office and to make sure that relationships are transformed. You say, you don't know the people I work with, mate. No, I don't. But I do know that our calling is to be servants, to be slaves, to be doulos, the slaves of God in that context. And I do know that as we change and transform our relationships with our workmates, so they begin to see something about it. And they say, hang on, what's going on with this person? You haven't got to witness by opening your mouth. 99% of our witness is done by the people we are, and the 1% is when they ask us why it is. Behave in the same way towards your slaves. Stop using threats. What would transform the individualism of our workplaces would be if we began to build the kind of relationships that there ought to be in a team of people who actually believe they're working together for a common cause. And even whether we're working with other people who are Christians or not, part of the mandate of God is work in partnership, working together for the cause of God, even though we can't see God's purposes necessarily in what we're doing. Masters behave in the same way towards your slaves and stop using threats. Ask God to bring the message of those ten tablets into your life. May the medicine of the ten tablets begin to transform you in your relationships with your workmates. And then last of all, and it's a bit of a solemn thing to finish with, but that's how Paul finishes. Remember you and your slaves belong to the same master in heaven who judges everyone by the same standard. Hard words, but it's there in Scripture. We can't avoid them. Our work is judged by God. What we do has got eternal perspective. It's quite hard to see sometimes. But God wants us to know that what we're going back to in, the, in Drudge City is actually something that he will hold us to account for later on. The liberty of it is that we haven't got to do it in our own strength. We've got the power of God's Holy Spirit in our lives to enable us to do it. But the solemn thing is that where we are, who we are, how we are in our daily work will be a subject that God will judge us on. And we need to recognise that. So what's your drudge city? What's it like? I hope it's not too difficult to live in. But I pray that you'll go back with integrity, as if serving Christ. That you'll pray that you'll go back with your own motivation, because you're working for God. Cheerfully, because you're not islands and you want to bring relationships in the workplace together. Knowing your reward is from God. Working not aggressively, but in teams. And knowing that the work is judged by God. You see, as you get in your car and you journey from the waste of Ness to the city of Drudge, you're going back to a place where the High King still reigns. He isn't just here in the city of the waste of Ness. He's there in your city of Drudge too, isn't he? He's still the High King wherever we go. He's still interested in all that you and all his slaves are doing at work, at home, in the community, in the church. The High King is there. Even though there's darkness around, the High King rules. You've got a royal pardon, and no one can take that away from you. You've got a Kango hammer, and that'll operate to break down quite a few walls. You've got a secret plan. You've got an inextinguishable candle. But most of all, Keep on taking the tablets.